with us online this morning. My name is Jess and I serve here as our kids minister and it is just a joy to welcome you this beautiful Sunday. If you are a first time visitor or if you've called this your church home for quite a while, we would love for you to go to our website, to our main page at goodnewschurch.life and in the lower right hand corner, you'll see a little dialog box. And if you would click on that and start a chat, you will be able to communicate with one of our staff members in real time. And we would love to hear um, what's going on in your life, get to know a little bit more about you, help you get to know what's going on in the church, to pray with you, or to even celebrate a victory in your life with you. So we would love to connect with you that way this morning. And also, we would love to, to say a huge congratulations to Mary Morgan and Nick Henderson on the birth of baby Bodie this week. She is absolutely precious, and we cannot wait to welcome her with open arms. Now, if you guys wouldn't mind, let's go to the Lord and some more worship this morning. Yeah. 
is there. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. church family. My name is Amanda Soss and I'm here today to talk to you about Supplied. Supplied is a ministry of good news that seeks to serve local families who are in need of financial assistance with back to school supplies. We know that during this time of economic downturn and job loss, there are many families in our community who are hurting. We are looking forward to serving these families at this year's event. We really could also use your help with registering these families. The best way to do this is to either share the link to families that you know would be interested in this assistance or to share the link on your social media page, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. To register or to share the link, simply go to the Good News homepage, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, and then click the word register. From there, you will be directed to either a Spanish supplied sign-up page or an English. We really are looking forward to this event this year. It is always such a blessing to those in the community. And um, year after year, we serve many of the same smiling faces, and we hope to also serve some new ones that could greatly benefit. Thank you. We want to thank you so much for your generosity over these weeks and giving your tithes and offerings. And because of you, we're able to continue to do programs like the Supplied Outreach, uh, which is the school supply outreach, which will start just in a few weeks here. So just a reminder of the three ways that you can give. You can give on our church website, which is goodnewschurch.life, or on the Church Center app. Or also you can just bring a, church, uh, bring a check up here to church or drop it in the mail. So if you will join me now in prayer as we pray over our offerings. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant, generous God. And out of your great mercy, you've given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend it and multiply its reach and influence. May it be a great blessing to many. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. worship. I pray that as your word is spoken, that we would receive it with joy. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, church. 
So I don't usually start off messages with a confession, but um, I need to do that today. I had this weird thing happen to me today where um, I was finishing up, getting ready to send my sermon notes over to Michael that he puts on the screens and everything, and we were looking at it, and I realized that we're on the week for patience, right? It's like love, joy, peace, patience, but somehow I just skipped over patience. Apparently, I didn't have the patience for patience to get to kindness, And so we're going to talk about kindness today, and we'll talk about patience next week because I just got them backwards, and I think it's a little ironic that in our cultural moment right now that I lack the patience to talk about patience and feel like we really just need to skip to kindness (laughs) because it feels like there's not a lot of kindness. And I'm in so many situations and so many circumstances, we seem to miss that. And so today, um, we're going to talk about this idea of kindness, and we'll come back to patience next week. And crazy enough, Michael was actually ready to sing that old Guns N' Roses song, Patience, today for us. But um, it just didn't work out, so maybe it'll be here next week, maybe not, we'll see. But right now, we live in this time where kindness, it, it feels like water in the desert sometimes. That it just feels like it's harder to find than we would like it to be. It seems a little bit like we wish there was more of it, and it seems like it should be easier to access. But yet we all have this tool that God has given us that costs nothing, but can really change almost everything. And it's this sense of kindness. And I think when we talk about it, a lot of us are used to that phrase, a random act of kindness. And we've heard that before, but, you know, we dropped something off at somebody's house slash um, Christmas. We as a church, we paid off all those layaways. That was really cool. Just this random act of kindness. There's actually these random act of kindness group mobs that will do all these different kind of things and go in places. And you can find their videos on YouTube and places like that. But there's this one group in particular that what they do is they love to gather like 100, 200 people and they'll go to different airports and they'll find somebody with a sign that's like waiting for, you know, like John Johnson or whatever. And they'll all just pretend like they're there to welcome John Johnson and they're dressed up and they got these big signs and streamers. And as like John Johnson comes off the plane, there's just hundreds of people yelling, welcome home, John Johnson. And it's just this random act of like this wonderful gesture of kindness. But what's unique and it's not exactly bad about random is that it's, well, random. That it's just kind of like out there in a culture that's so isolated for us as people, right? And as we, we live in a culture that's full of people who find themselves so experience rich and relationally poor, that random actually costs us a lot less because we get to do it on our terms, when we want, where we want, how we want, and we don't have to actually do the hard work of finding out what somebody's actual needs are so that we can meet them in a way that might actually cost us something. And it doesn't mean random's bad. It just means that there's maybe a better way. And there's another way and a different way. And it's not random acts of kindness, but it's intentional acts of kindness. It's intentional acts of kindness within relationships that we've cultivated where we're able to step in and meet real needs in a way that's really encouraging and really uplifting the way that God has done for us. And so this word kindness, it shows up all over the scripture. I'm in the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew word for it is hesad. In the New Testament, it's funny, the, the word for kindness is Christos, it's C-H-R-E-S-T-O-S, but the word for Christ was spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S. So there was Christos as kindness, and Christos is Christ. And when the early church was moving, a lot of people would refer to the church as the kind people, because they would get that I and the E a little bit mixed up, and they'd say, oh, yeah, like those followers of Christos, the Christos, the kind ones. And it was this mark of who the church was. It was this mark of this movement of people who were bringing this gospel, this good news, who were known for their love and they were known for their kindness. But this this biblical notion of kindness is more than just a moment of nicety when it happens to work out randomly. It's this intentionality. It's a way where we don't look to live in moments of kindness, but where we make a commitment to kindness. And it's different, this commitment than just this moment. And so when we see a commitment, it's a commitment to kindness that is unwavering to someone who's unable to really repay us for that kindness. And I think when we start to get into that notion of kindness, it's really close, much closer to this biblical idea of kindness and what that looks like. Zechariah chapter 7 in the Old Testament says to show kindness and mercy to one another. And it goes on and talks about how we're called to do that to those on the fringes. Micah 6, it says we're called to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with our God. God's loving kindness is talked about all over the Psalms. And one place in particular I want us to look at in this idea of kindness today is in in the book of 2 Samuel. 
And I want to introduce you to this guy named Bosch. That's not his real name, but that's what we're going to call him because his real name is really, really complicated here in the scriptures. And so to introduce you to this guy named Bosch in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, it says this, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. So he couldn't walk. And they go on to explain why. It says he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan and their death came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and they fled. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and he became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. So we're just going to call him Bosch so we don't have to say that all night, okay? Now, Saul was the first king of God's people in the Old Testament. So we look at these people in this little story right here. Saul is the first king of God's people in the Old Testament who ultimately disqualifies himself from being king. Jonathan is Saul's son who is an heir to the throne of Saul and who is really, really good friends with David. Now, David is Jonathan's friend who is on his way to becoming king because of Saul's mistakes. And so it's a complicated relationship, right? You see this, you have the father, the son, you have the one who's going to replace the father as the king. And one of the things that really complicates this is that when you become king, one of the things that you sort of have to do is you got to get rid of the old kingdom. You got to get rid of the old leaders. And oftentimes when a new king came in, they would just go and execute the entire family of the old king because there would be this threat that these old folks would want to come and take over and try to reclaim that kingship. And so it creates this awkward situation, right? Because here you have Saul, who used to be king, Jonathan, who sees that David's about to become king, and they're all buddies. And so Jonathan sees the writing on the wall of what's going to happen to him and his family. And so there's this really complicated interaction that's going on right here. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 20, we see this conversation between David and Jonathan about this kindness and about this covenantal kind of kindness and this commitment to kindness, not just this one-time, one-off when it's convenient type of kindness. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14, Jonathan is talking to David right here. And he says, but show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live so that I may not be killed. So you see this, right? He's saying to him, he's like, okay, like we know what's about to happen here, but you could choose to be kind in a way that's going to spare me my life right here. And he says, and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the faces of the earth. He's like, even when you feel completely safe, even when everything's good, even when God is like so clearly on your side, please, 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 please remember us. And so he's kind of like pleading with him in this. So then in verse 16, it says, So Jonathan makes this covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan and David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. And so there's this agreement made. It's not just this random act, but it's this commitment to kindness. It's this commitment that even though I don't have to, even though maybe I even shouldn't in some instances, he says, I'm going to choose to do this for your sake. And so we fast forward in the story, the agreement's made, Jonathan and Saul die in battle, David's now king, and this remembrance of this oath of kindness starts to come back to David. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And as we walk through this part of the story right here, it's so funny. So David's become king, and he's about to have this encounter with Jonathan's family, our buddy Bosch, who we remember from a little bit ago. And so David, he asks in the kingdom, he says, Is there anybody still left in the house of Saul whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And now there's this servant of Saul's and he comes in and they start having this conversation and they're trying to figure it out. And this guy's named Ziba and the king asks him, he said, is there, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And he remembers this oath and he remembers this commitment to kindness. He remembers this willing decision that he made that he said, I am on your team. I'm going to do this. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be there for you, for your family. I'm going to spare you. And he asks him that, and it's this God's kindness, which is this undeserved kind of kindness. And so Ziba answers the king, and he says, well, there is Jonathan's son who's crippled in both feet, and you might remember him. And king's like, well, okay, where is he? Let's go get him. And so the king sends for him, and you can just imagine this encounter, right? 
You have Bosch, our buddy here, who's, who's sitting in his house. He's just probably hiding out thinking he hopes that David doesn't find out about him and that he's, you know, in line from the old kingdom and all this kind of stuff. And one day, like, boom, 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 there's this knock on the door. And it's somebody from David's kingdom. And they said, are you Bosch? And he's like, yeah. And he said, come with us. And you can imagine the weight of this moment for our buddy Bosch, right? This is like the end of the road. This is the green mile kind of walk, right? Like he doesn't pack a bag to go see David because he gets what's probably about to happen in this encounter. And so he starts walking and he goes and he gets to the kingdom and he gets before David. And it says, when, Me- when Bosh, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul came to David, he bows down at David and he says, your servant is here. And then in verse seven, David replies to him. He says, don't be afraid. He gets all the things that he's thinking. He gets all the things that he's feeling. But this isn't about that kind of vengeance. This is about a new way of kindness. This is about this new picture of what it looks like. And David says to him, he says, for I will surely show you, and here's that word again, kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. He says, I'm going to restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And he says, and you will always eat at my table. So you'll always, right? You can just circle that word always because it's not this one time, one off kind of deal, but it's this commitment to kindness. And he says, you are in and there is nothing you can do to repay me for this. He's like, I'm the king. I've got it all. You can't respond to this in any way, but you are here and you are welcome and you are in this place. And so Bosch is just blown away by this, right? And he doesn't understand it. And he bows down and he falls at his feet. And in verse eight, he says this, how great is this? He says, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me. He just gets it. He's like, this is just so undeserved. This is so unmerited. There's nothing that I can do to deserve this. And as the story wraps up in chapter 11, it says, so Bosch ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And so we look at this story and this this huge moment of kindness that is really not just a moment, but it's this commitment to this way of kindness. And I love that question that David asks, to whom can I show God's kindness? And so if we're really going to understand God's kindness, we got to understand that this story gives us a glimpse of God's kindness. And to give you just a hint, I think as we look at that story from 2 Samuel, and as we look at Bosch, I think we need to view ourselves in that story as the helpless Bosch who refers to ourselves as the dogs. We're the ones who don't deserve it. But yet God in his unending grace, in his unending mercy, sends Jesus who invites us and creates a place for us at the table. And you see, when we understand that that's the grace that we've been given, that's the kindness that we have been shown, it changes the way that we give and show kindness to those around us. It wasn't a one-off. It wasn't something that we had to earn. It wasn't something that we deserved. But yet because of grace, the good news of the gospel is that we still get a seat at the table through Jesus. Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. See, once we receive that kindness, we start to ask, whom can we show that kindness to? And it means something different on that other side of Jesus. It can still be the random stuff sometimes, right? We can show up on social media and surprise with kindness. We can be kind to families who are trying to figure out school situations right now where there just doesn't seem like there's a right answer for anybody in this. But we can choose kindness as we process all these decisions. We can do this like jerks. We can do this complaining. We can do this angry. Or we can do this in a way that is so kind That when people see us processing these difficult decisions, these difficult situations, and these difficult times, they're like, oh, the Christos, the Christos, those kind ones. We know where that comes from. It's the followers of Jesus. And in the midst of so much cultural, conversational, situational darkness around all the complexities, all the unknowns, all of the challenges, church, I would just say to you right now, one of the greatest opportunities we have to shine as the church is to simply be kind. And so how do we do that in this season? 
How do we do this about going to school? How do we be kind about masks in the debate, right? How do we be kind about political opinions? How do we be kind about all the stuff that we see the unkindness surrounding day in and day out right now? And I think one of the things that makes us kind is when we realize how kind God has been to us. And when we look at ourselves and we look at our own lives, right, it's kind of comical. Like we look back on the decisions we made and we, we're so like frustrated with what we did and we wonder how God could have been faithful to us back then. And I hope that that would make us so much, so much less judgmental to the people around us now. I mean, I look back at some of our old wedding pictures and I look at like the clothes I was wearing and my haircut and the music I was listening to and I think, why did Rachel marry me? Right? Like I've changed, I've grown, I've become better. And so when we look at people in this moment and we refuse to be kind because of a situational thing, like can we step back and get some perspective on that and say, God has been so kind to us through the years, through all of our decisions, through all of our mistakes, through all of the things that we've done. Can we not muster up some kindness in this moment? You see, when we understand the kindness that's been given to us, it helps us to be kind on the other side. So yeah, some of it can be a little bit random, but some of it is this kindness about this commitment, this showing up and saying, you know what, I'm going to be there and we're going to do this and we're going to be in this place for the long haul. So a um, while back, um, I encountered this guy and I had a long conversation with him and he asked me, he said, tell, tell me something that's on your heart right now. He said, what's something that you just kind of hope, a ministry, a prayer that you have? And for whatever reason, I was at this retreat and um, this guy that I hadn't met sat down next to me and he just started up this conversation. And so I said, well, I'll tell you, I said, one, one thing that's been on my heart a lot lately is um, other pastors. And so I'll, I'll just put an asterisk on the beginning of the story, okay? Like, I'm good. Our church is wonderful to me. Our leadership is wonderful to me. I serve in this church under a bishop who actually is trying to figure out ways to punish us if we don't take all of our vacation, okay? So like, we're good. I'm really well taken care of. I mean that with everything in me. But that's not everybody's story. And as I've kind of walked through this season of being a senior pastor for these last few years, I've heard story after story after story of pastors who have struggled, who have burned out, who have made bad decisions, who have, you know, just kind of had to leave the ministry because of moral failures. And, and this was just something that was got to put on my heart that I'd started to see over and over and over again. And so this guy comes up and he's like, so what's something on your heart? And I said, you know, this is because earlier that day I'd had an experience with a friend who'd made some bad decisions and we were talking through that and he was moving out of his role as a pastor. And so I said, gosh, you know, where we live down here at the beach, I just think it would be such this wonderful thing if we could figure out a way to find pastors who are struggling and hurting and about to be on the edge of burnout and to be able to just give them a place of retreat and escape to come to down here at the beach. I was like, you know, we're down here. We live here. We have access to this. We know restaurant people. We know, you know, all, we know our way around here. And I was like, this could be such a good blessing if we could just figure out how to make that work for some people. He's like, oh, cool. And so we just kind of carried on, kept going with the conversation. Everything was good. About two weeks later, I get this phone call. He's like, hey, it's me, you know? And I was like, hey, yeah, you know, like kind of almost didn't even remember this casual conversation that we had. And he said, I'm in. And I was like, for what? Right? Like, I don't know what we're in for. And he's like, no, that pastor's thing. He said, I just went home and I've been praying about it and it's just been all over my heart. And he said, and this guy, he lives in Charleston, South Carolina. And he says, so here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to send you $10,000. And he goes, and then I'm going to start sending you $500 a week for you to just use to bless pastors. And I said, well, do you know any? And he's like, no. And I was like, do you really even know me? And he's like, no. And he's like, but I just feel like God has put this on my heart. I see this need. And he said, so we're, we're going to do this. All right. And I was like, oh, Okay. And so, you know, sometimes in the afternoons, I start figuring this out and we put together these retreats and they just, they went like just point blank. I'll just tell you the truth. They just went terrible, right? Like it was so hard to get these pastor schedules aligned, get them squared away, renting places, like all the things. It turned out that it was like a full-time job. And I was like, I just can't do this. I got a full-time job. And so we, we just kind of backed off from it. And I started to have this guilt in me. And I was like, man, I'm gonna have to call this guy and tell him that he just sent all this money to this dude that he doesn't really know and it didn't go well. And so I would just like, sometimes be sitting in my office and it would just kind of wash over me and I'd have this pit in my stomach and I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna have to call him and tell him or he's gonna show up here one day and be like, how's it going? And I'm gonna have to be like, terrible, you know, and like have to do all that. But so we're sitting there and, and finally one day he texts me and he says, hey, let's chat tomorrow. And I was like, oh, here we go, right? And so the next morning he calls and we get on the phone and we're sitting there and we're talking and I kind of fess up and tell him about how um, it didn't go well at all. And 
all this stuff. And he looks at, and he, you know, we're sitting on the phone. And he goes, no, man, it's cool. He said, I'm in this for the long haul. And he said, and I see this need and I get it. And he goes, so we're going to just figure this out. He said, so here's some more money. Let's try round two. I thought, man, if that isn't this commitment to kindness, if that isn't this showing up in a way that says, this isn't a random act, this isn't a one-off, this is like, I'm in this. And it's a different kind of kindness. And as he gave me this pep talk, he's like, man, I'm with you. I support you. I believe in this. We're going to do this. And I just was so overwhelmed by the way he said that, the way he shared that with me, that I thought, man, I want to live like that. I want to be kind like that. I want to show up in other people's lives. I want to lead a church full of people who show up in other people's lives, not just for the afternoon, not just for the one-off, but show up for the long term. And it's not just the money. It's not like a $10,000 thing because last week, a couple weeks ago, probably, I got this call from somebody who said, hey, I just want you to know um, this has been a tough couple seasons for everybody. Things are going hard. For the next two weeks, every morning, I'm going to be praying for you. And they just texted me every morning, 8 a.m., said, hey, praying for you. What can I be praying for you? Hey, praying for you. What can I be praying for you? In two weeks, every single morning it showed up. And that was so powerful to me, that commitment, right? Not just that one-off thing, but that commitment to show up day after day after day that I've just started incorporating that into my daily disciplines. And I've tried to just find people that I find are in transition or going into difficult seasons and saying, hey, I'm praying for you for two weeks. And I just commit myself to locking in every morning and saying it's not a one-off, but it's this long-term kindness, despite the results, despite what you can give back to me, despite what I'm getting out of it, but this commitment towards kindness. Maybe that's sponsoring a child. Maybe that's, um, you know, whatever that may be for you as you look through that. Maybe you've had success in your industry and you're kind of on top of the game right now. And what what that long-term kindness looks like is for you to find somebody who's new in the industry and to just walk up to him and say, hey, listen, I'm offering myself once a month. If you want to sit down, I'm going to pour into you everything I know. I'm going to send you business. I'm going to send you clients. And we just bring that kindness into a place that so often lacks it. And so as we talk about this series that we're in right now, the fruit of the spirit, and what does it look like for us to do the next right thing. What does that look like for you? What does it mean to really just dwell on the kindness and goodness of God that we have received, that we have been given a seat at the table that is undeserved, that is unshakable? And how can we live in response to that? Can we be kind? Not in a moment of kindness, but a commitment way of kindness. Back to the story of David and Jonathan, right? A covenantial way of kindness that says, I'm here whether you like it or not. I'm showing up. I'm committed. Like I am in this with you. So we've been given a seat at the table. Can we do the same? To whom can you show God's kindness? That's the question David asks, right? He sits there in the castle and he says, to whom can I show God's kindness? So the question for us, right, in light of what we know, in light of what we've received, in light of the kindness we've received, to whom can we show God's kindness? What's your next right thing? Amen.
Well, church, we hope you're having a good morning. As we close up, I just want to share this with you. I don't say these every time this is happening, but it seemed appropriate today. Um, actually, this weekend, we have um, a pastor in town named Rocky Shack, and Rocky is from um, Mississippi. He's Jackson, Mississippi. He's an associate pastor at First Methodist Church there, and um, they've had a tough season. Um, his in-laws have been diagnosed with some cancer, and it's been a tough season on their family, and so they're all here along with their um, three-year-old daughter on the um, pastor's retreat fund, and so so our church, along with um, my buddy, has been able to come alongside and bless them. So be praying for them today that um, as they're in our little community here with us today, that God would just bless them in a great way. And it'd be such a restorative time for them here in our community this weekend. So let's pray as you receive this benediction. God, we pray that you would send us out today to be your church and your people full of kindness, the short-term kind and the long-term kind. And so we may we make commitments to show up even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it doesn't seem to be working like we hoped it would, just because that's what you have done for us. And so we thank you for that, Jesus, and we pray that we can go forth and be your church and your people in this place, in this time, confident that you're with us, for us, and in us. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. We'll see you next week.